Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's lecture uh, of um, ACT, uh, Cinematic Migrations. Uh, I'm really happy that um, it's possible to be able to host Ross Gray. Um, she's come from London and uh, to join us. And uh, I've been wanting to meet her for years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've been in uh, correspondence, uh, and also she's written about my work. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that she's able to join us. Uh, and I think that her work is, is very fitting uh, for the, the theme, the sort of overall theme of cinematic migrations. Um, and I'm very curious to find out um, more about the militant image a cine, <laughs> cine geography. Um, Ross Gray's work, uh, her research focuses on revolutionary cinema and its global networks. Uh, the screen uh, as a site of radical gra gathering, anti-colonial and post-colonial theory and contemporary film and video art within the context of cinematic, cinema, gra cinema cinematographic, mouthful, uh, traditions and different liberation movements on the African continent. Um, Ross Gray uh, co-edited a special issue of the journal Third Text, um, it was with Kojo Eshun, uh, called The Militant Image, uh, A Cine Geography. Uh, and she's published uh, articles in numerous uh, scholarly and artistic publications. Um, she explores some of these themes in her forthcoming book, uh, which is entitled The Vanguard of the World, Cinemas of the African Revolution. Um, she is a lecturer in fine art practice at Goldsmiths College in London and a research tutor in curating a contemporary art program at the Royal College of Art. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ross Gray. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. I'm really very, very delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to thank you and all the people organizing this event. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure. So I'm going to begin with a clip from the beginning of a film called Scenes from the Class Struggle in Portugal. Um, it's a film that was made in 1977 by two Americans, Robert Kramer and Philip Spinelli. And it's about a brief revolutionary period that followed the toppling of Portugal's uh, fascist colonial regime that had been in power since 1932. So this is a coup that was carried out on the 25th of April 1974 by the army, which had been radicalized by some 15 years fighting a colonial war in Guinea-Bissau, Angola, and Mozambique. The army became the Movimento das Forças Armadas, the MFA, which supported the masses of people who took to the streets in Portugal and seized businesses, factories, land, and private property, and turned them into cooperatives. For about a year, it seemed like the un unimaginable might actually happen, a socialist revolution in, in the late 20th century on the very western tip of Europe. But it was also a moment when filmmakers and activists recognized the importance of film and television to document and intervene in the situation that was unfolding. It was an opportunity to dismantle the institutions that had regulated and censored film production. And it was a chance to create new modes of filmmaking and distribution so that the, film, the moving image could become an agent of radical social change. So I'm just going to show this clip, which is right from the beginning of the film. We made this movie between 1975 and 1977. The two of us, both North Americans. Eu sou 
Many things have changed in Portugal. This is one of the first postcards I saw there. The example of the overthrow of the popular unity government was fresh in people's minds. There was a chant in 1975. Portugal will not be the Chile of Europe. Pela liberdade sem fronteiras, pelas manhãs de sol sem mágoa. Phil and I were caught up in a whirlwind. Lutaremos, meu amor, pela dádiva mútua da nossa. We found every detail can be found again in another scene. The whole story is latent in each image, each face, each contradiction. Same thing for this movie. April 25th, 1974. 48 years of fascism are ended in Portugal. Fascist laws, institutions, police no longer control. Who will take their place? Who will benefit from the change? What's possible now? Almost no destruction of property, stealing. I often heard working people say, don't take that, it belongs to the people. Sense of each other, a people. The relative peacefulness was incredible to us, North Americans, given the order of change underway. We can only film parts of this process, see parts of it. It really is scenes from Portugal. We were looking for ourselves in it, for clues to the future. So I'm sorry to stop it there. Um, so this is a film that articulates a militant subjectivity through its transnational affiliations and styles of communist friendship. Individual commitments to socially engaged, formally inventive filmmaking as here exemplified by the cine activism of Robert Kramer, at this moment found an opportunity to participate in a situation of revolutionary upheaval in which radical filmmaking was being actively encouraged and supported by the Portuguese provisional government. Kojo Eschen and I have used the term cine geography to designate such situated cine cultural practices in an expanded sense and the connections individual, institutional, aesthetic and political that link them to other situations of urgent struggle. Scenes from the class struggle in, in Portugal was in fact completed after this radical moment had come to an end, um, when a period of what was called normalization was underway, in which property and businesses were privatized once again. The film is self-consciously partisan and partial in the narrative of the event. These are scenes from the class struggle in Portugal, and yet they speak to other moments in the past, and thus also to the future. One of the things I'll like to draw your attention to is this postcard from Chile, which is strategically positioned to open the film. As Naomi Klein points out in her book, The Shock Doctrine, the extremely violent overthrow of Allende's democratically elected socialist government on the 11th of September, 1973, is an earlier 9-11 atrocity widely erased from collective memory. With this reference, the film seems to address directly the current conjuncture, as it marks the emergence of the neoliberal project that dominates our present, and then now makes it so difficult for us to access our militant past. So following um, the publication of, of the special issue of third text that Kosha and I edited, we did a series of, of events, screenings, um, where we'd film, uh, screen films and have kind of quite lengthy discussions, public discussions around them. And one of the films that we screened was Scenes from the Class Struggle in Portugal. Um, and this was part of a series of uh, events called The Militant Image. And what was shocking to us was the way in which, despite vast differences, these, at the end of the, the film, there is another page of sort of key terms. Um, and these terms are phrases such as IMF, austerity, violence, and so on, which seem as politically relevant today as they were over 30 years ago, at the beginning of the acceleration of the neoliberal, the global neoliberal project that's our current condition. 
So what we're contending with is not only an archive that is fragmented, often inaccessible and decaying, but also the weight of neoliberal ideology that has produced what Kojo and I have called the condescension of the present towards the archive of, archives of tricontinental militancy. And this to us is what makes this task of reconstruction, of questioning and analyzing um, this insubordinate, experimental, committed filmmaking of the militant image so urgent to us now. Okay, so that was all part of an introduction. And what I'm going to do now is turn to talk about one particular cinegeography of the militant image, which is namely the cinema culture that was constructed after independence in Mozambique. And I'm going to situate that as part of a, a as at the center of a transnational movement. Um, this movement sought to harness cinema as an agent of social change in Africa and to decolonize filmmaking itself, its modes of production, distribution, and exhibition. Um, I'm going to identify a more militant cultural turn that emerged with the armed struggles in Lucifer in Africa. And in the late 1960s, what we see taking hold in parts of the continent is the notion of liberation as being, in the words of Amilcar Cabral, an act of culture. By then, Algiers and Ouagadougou were becoming key sites for gatherings that articulated a more strident form of pan-African cu cultural radicalism than that, um, for instance, in Senghor, Senegal. Events such as the FESPACO Film Fest Festival, which first took place in 1969, the Pan-African Cultural Festival in Algiers, also in 1969, and the meeting of third world filmmakers in Algiers in 1973 helped to consolidate an international strategy for cinema to act on the cultural front against imperialism. This was a strategy in which the revolutionary nation state was understood as the most effective means through which to decolonize filmmaking and organize on an international scale. When Mozambique became independent in 1975, um, an Instituto Nacional de Cinema, National Cinema Institute, was established, known as the INC, and M Maputo became another key site in this cartography of radical cinema. Drawing on the experience of making films about the armed struggle with foreign filmmakers, on the amateur filmmakers and cinephiles of the colonial cine clubs, and on the international connections of solidarity, the culture of cinema that developed in Mozambique can be understood as an initial realization of ambitions for what a liberated cinema might be, ambitions that were local, pan-African, and worldly in their vision. This period is significant not only to the, to the construction of a history of filmmaking in Mozambique, but also for the possibility that for a few years, Mozambican cinema seemed to offer to the world. So I'm going to talk about, a bit about this idea of liberation as an act of culture, and which really developed through the experience of the, uh, the armed resistance to colonialism and suggested that collective participation in revolution would produce specifically African forms of modernity. For the assimilated elite of Lucifer Africans who met in, as students in Portugal in the 1950s, the rediscovery of their African roots through poetry and other artistic forms was a process of reconnecting with a cultural memory and shared, ex shared experience that the system of assimilation had sought to wipe out. Their cultural activities were at this stage connected to the negritude movement that began in the early 20th century. And this took, took place alongside political organization that led, eventually led figures such as Cabral, Augustino Neto, um, Eduardo Monlen, Oscar Monteiro, and uh, Jorge Rabello, among others who had studied in Portugal and elsewhere, to form independence movements. Mass participation in armed struggle soon came to be understood as the only way to achieve in independence. And during the 1960s and 70s, Cabral and others developed a more militant notion of, the, uh, notion of the role of culture in political change that chimed with Fanon's critique of negritude. So this shared experience of Portuguese colonialism meant that the liberation movements in Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, and Angola were closely connected. In the speech, The Role of Culture in the Struggle for Independence, Cabral argues that the potential for transformation is the most fundamental aspect of the human condition. Cabral notes that ca capitalist globalization gave new worlds to the world and gave a more profound knowledge of humanity as a totality in movement with a, a unity in the diverse complexity of its development. 
The liberation struggle creates different kinds of knowledge, however. It is, and I quote, a repost to the accumulation of information and ethnographic knowledges that group people according to supposedly timeless categories of race, caste, ethnicity, and which become the target for those who study societies called primitive or in development. Instead, says Cabral, the struggle brings out about the need to understand the characteristics of societies in radical change and struggle. Expanding the notion of culture beyond artifacts and objects to describe new forms of life and ways of living together, then beginning to be constructed in the liberated zones, Cabral puts forward the notion that liberation is in itself an act of culture. And this is the way that Cabral was able to assert that Guinea-Bissau's revolution was what made that country, at that particular moment, the vanguard of the world. Revolution was the means by which the people of Guinea-Bissau defined themselves and showed that we too are in the world. So across the continent in the 1960s, the notion that liberation is an act of culture was beginning to be realized through filmmaking and other cultural actions. And the year 1969 saw an explosion of cultural events and inaugurations. And I mentioned the Fespaco Film Festival, which first took place in Ouagadougou, bringing anti-colonial films to an African public and functioning as a meeting place for filmmakers. Um, the same year, um, Algiers hosted the first Pan-African Cultural Festival, which received delegations from the Lucifer liberation movements, as well as from independent states across the continent. And it was one of the means by which Algeria sought to assert itself as a center for a new militant Pan-Africanism. In 1973, the meeting of third world filmmakers was held in Algiers to lay the groundwork for an organization of third world filmmakers. And filmmakers including Usman Semben, Flora Gomez from Guinea-Bissau, Santiago Alvarez from Cuba, Med Hondo from Mauritania, Simon Hartog, um, a British film producer connected with the film co-ops, um, and who later worked for the INC, among any, many others, discussed common problems and different aspects of what a liberated cinema might look like. Um, what began to emerge and circulate in these crucial years on the cinema screen are images of a new political constituency, that of newly empowered African peoples in the process of liberating themselves. So the experience of, of working with foreign filmmakers during the armed struggle um, led Frelimo, by the time of independence, to be convinced that cinema could teach the, pe the people of Mozambique the meaning of independence, what it meant to be Mozambican, and could show how the needs of, pe of peasants and workers would dictate the revolution. The armed struggle had taught Frelimo that rural populations, divided by culture and language, with little frame of reference outside their immediate worlds, had no inherent nationalist commitment to an abstract notion of independence. Thus, when the INC was established in 1976, its mission was to deliver to the people an image of the people. According to Frelimo, the primary role of film production in revolutionary Mozambique was to teach, to inform, and to mobilize. So in the immediate aftermath of independence, um, the vast majority of, of the Portuguese population left, and um, this led to a kind of situation of chaos. Um, so in order to keep the cinemas in the cities running, they set up a Serviço Nacional de Cinema, and this Serviço produced a number of films during the, the first year of independence in 1975. Um, I'm going to talk about just two of them because I think they prov provide quite an interesting contrast. Um, they were both made to document independence. One of them was, was by um, the Yugoslav director Dragostan Popovic, uh, a film called Do Remova, From Remova to Maputo, which was released in 1975. And it followed um, Samora Michel, who was the leader of Frelimo and became the first president of Mozambique, his month-long journey across the country to Maputo, which is right in the south, which culminated in the proclamation of independence on the 25th of June. And this recording of Michel's reception by the crowds who flocked to catch a glimpse of him, um, in the film, the journey comes to signify Frelimo's symbiosis with, with the desires of the people. Um, and this film by Popovich was particularly amenable to the party for, for mobilisation. Um, 
However, there were, at this sort of early moment of independence, there were other ways of, of um, that Mozambican resistance to colonialism and independence were treated, some of which were more experimental and expressive. So another film that was produced that year was a film called Vinticinco, 25, by Brazilians José Salso and Salso Lucas. Um, and these two were part of a Brazilian theatre group that was much influenced by the radical pedagogy of Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal's Theatre of the Oppressed. They left Brazil, which was then under military dictatorship, to go to Portugal at the time of the Carnation Revolution before going to, to Mozambique. So Vinticinco is about Mozambican independence, but it also expresses a global political imagination that suggests that this specific struggle is part of a culture of revolution beyond borders that has an almost mystical dimension. The film begins and ends with images of a blackboard in one of the liberated zones. On this blackboard, a woman spells out revolution. The al this alphabet of revolution is a new language that colonized peoples are learning so as to liberate themselves. So Vinticinco is a film that, 25 is a film that, that combines uh, all sorts of different materials, um, footage from the liberated zones, celebrations of independence, uh, grassroots reenactments of anti-colonial resistance, um, and symbolic sequences. And it's a film without narrative structure, lasting in the longest version, three hours, um, or over three hours. And it includes images and sounds of Samora Michelle, Martin Luther King, Black Panther demonstrations, and Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, suggesting a common culture of revolutionary struggle, liberation, and political consciousness reaching out across time and space. Significantly, however, the party didn't know quite what to make of 25. And while it was screened widely internationally, it slipped into its obscurity in Mozambique. Instead, Popovich's films, which were far more orthodox, became the film, the film most widely distributed across the country through mobile cinema units. 25 is excessive in length and style, and this exuberance could be understood as an expression of freedom liberated from the demands of both commercialism and propaganda. Yet there are other aspects that militate against its appropriation to the party line. In one sequence, 25 switches from the state celebrations of independence in Maputo, with flags being raised, military salutes, and politicians embracing each other, to a scene on the beach where people gather to celebrate independence in another way. A huge crowd forms a circle around a fire. The sun rises, and waves crash on the beach, and they sing and dance in a different kind of ritual. The film thus refuses to ally the party with the people, here signified as a more mysterious multitude of bodies who, it seems, are somewhere else with their own modes of expression that cannot be fully represented by the symbols and rhetoric of, a, of, of official politics. So the INC was set up uh, a year later in 1976 with equipment seized from the colonial production houses and cameras and mobile cinema units donated by the USSR. The INC had a film archive that comprised an eclectic collection of films, including British documentaries, Soviet films, and Indian musicals. The archive also included colonial productions, which were recycled into new films, such as um, the essay film, These Were the Weapons, by Morelio Salas, um, a Brazilian filmmaker who came to do, um, do training at the INC. And such films debunked the myths of, of Portuguese imperialism. Simon Hartog, the British film producer who I mentioned earlier, came to work at the INC and he devised a new system of acquisition and distribution so as to break the INC's dependency on American distributors. And this led to the MPEA um, taking the decision to boycott Mozambique in an attempt to maintain its monopoly. Um, so the new system of acquisition involved buying actual copies of the films rather than merely renting them so as to build up an archive of international films. The profits were then ploughed back into film production and training so as to bypass the American distributors. And it was a system that in the first few years was very successful. Um, and in the years that followed, Mozambique sought to develop this in partnership with other African countries, though it has to be said with quite limited um, success, although they did organise sort of international conferences and so on. Um, and their idea was to... Um, create a new economic sphere, a new economic sphere of cinema. Um, 
So the staff at the INC included Frelimo activists who had been involved in information and film production during the armed struggle, international corporants who were people who came, professionals who were paid, um, but also had a sort of political commitment to, to Mozambique, and Portuguese Mozambicans who had committed themselves to the new nation. Um, and many of these, um, such as José Cardoso, had been involved in the colonial film clubs that had been a clandestine site of dissent for those who opposed fascism. This cinephilic tendency militated against Frelimo's more instrumentalist idea of film as a tool of information, education and mobilisation. And the INC attempted to build a critically informed culture of cinema through international film festivals focusing on, for example, Algerian, Cuban, Italian and African cinema. And they produced very, very nice um, educational booklets which are very sort of detailed and careful in, in their research. The INC also began training up a new generation of Mozambican filmmakers who it was, the idea was that they would be the children of workers and peasants. Um, uh, Frelimo saw this as a key task in the decolonization of cinema as under colonialism only a few black technicians and cameramen had been able to find work in subordinate positions. In 1976, a group of Mozambicans who were actually still at school were selected to learn different aspects of, of filmmaking and were trained mainly through learning on the job. And it's worth mentioning that this was a, a program that was actually quite controversial within the INC. There were, particularly um, amongst the foreign corporants, some of them felt that one should be an intellectual first and then a filmmaker. So um, they experienced a certain degree of resistance um, but nevertheless, the fact that most of the tra trainees still work in, in television and film bears testament to the success of the program um, and to, to the fact that rapid social transformation rarely happens without a, a strategy of, of intervention. During this, this early stage of radical experimentation, um, a number of, of, of foreign filmmakers also came to do sort of separate projects, one of which was Jean Rouche, another Jean-Luc Godard, and they came to carry out training and research. That they had quite different relationships to, to what was going on. So Rouche was invited by Jacques Datouy, who was then cultural attaché for France in Mozambique, and this was a role that he'd previously performed in Chile at the time of Allende's um, popular revolutionary government. Godard's connection was different. He had been invited by Jacinto Veloso, who was then Minister for Security, who had been in charge of Frelimo's clandestine operation during the armed struggle in um, Europe and Algeria. Um, so Godard was asked to carry out research into how Mozambique might provide a liberationist form of television for its people. At that time, Mozambique didn't have television, um, and it actually only arrived in 1981. Um, he named his project Birth of the Image of a Nation, so of the image had brackets around it, referencing D.W. Griffith's 1915 film Birth of a Nation, um, a film which I'm sure you're all, all aware of. Um, uh, so uh, Goddard, what Goddard eventually proposed was that his own company, Sonny Marge, would train up a local communities to use video to make whatever they wanted and this would form the basis for, for material for broadcast. Um, it was a proposal that was judged to be completely unrealistic and it was re rejected by the Mozambican government though I think it should be said that as far as I know no researchers have actually seen the proposal so the extent to which this was a completely utopian project I think still remains open to, to question. Um, by the late 1970s, this period of experimentation associated with the chaotic early years of independence was superseded by a drive towards professionalism and efficiency, and this was guided to a significant degree by the Brazilian filmmaker Riquiara, who had a sort of behind-the-scenes advisory role. Um, and during these years, one of the key productions um, gearing up to the... Um, uh, arrival of television was a newsreel called Kusha Kanema. 
Um, the Kushakanema newsreel was first produced in 1978, and then from 1981 it was produced as a, a weekly 10-minute film, um, which was distributed across the, the country by, with mobile cinema units. And one of its chief intentions was to weave a cohesive image of national identity based on revolutionary nat nationalism that would cut across ethnic and linguistic differences. So the name means birth of cinema, um, with words from Ranga, Shangane, Shua, Makua, combined to symbolize the unity of the nation. So it had a function not only to inform, but also to promote the exemplary revolutionary fervor of the new Mozambican, embodied by the Mozambican president, Samora Michel. This was a figure of discourse that had emerged during the armed struggle as a model of disciplined militancy that was intended to inspire Frelimo cadres stationed in Tanzania who might otherwise have been tempted by the relative comforts of the city of Dar es Salaam. Machel had a very distinctive mode of deportment and the way in which he hectored and conjooled his audiences was hugely popular with, with cinema spectators. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some extracts from a, doc, um, a documentary about the newsreel um, by Margarita Cardoso. Um, and one of the things that um, Margarita Cardoso does in her documentary is she, um, I think, quite effectively uh, shows how the films would have been, would have been uh, experienced. So... So I'm going to show just three short clips, one after another. Nascemos em maio deste ano. Com o Cuxa Canema, o cinema em Moçambique entrou na batalha da informação, produzindo todas as semanas 10 minutos de notícias em imagens e sons. Oito cópias em 35 mm correm as salas do país, enquanto o cinema móvel se propõe projetar as cópias de 16 mm onde salas de cinema não existam. os outros habitantes da aldeia que hoje à noite, às sete e meia, temos uma projeção de filme. Então vocês vão ver, vocês a trabalharem com o camarada presidente. Hein? Vocês já ouviram falar de internacionalismo, não ouviram? Vocês já ouviram falar de solidariedade? Então esses carros que estão aqui foram oferecidos pelo povo da União Soviética. Nós vivemos como 
animal. Só. É que eles gostavam. Agora somos quase todos o mesmo agora. Embora que não somos o mesmo agora, o coração todo é a mesma coisa. Somos independentes. Explain a bit about the the images you've seen, particularly the 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 dance at, at the end. There's a dance called the Makwaela, which um, I think is a sort of a symbol of African modernity. This this dance performed by workers in front of this modernist factory is a very powerful image. Um, so the Makwaela is um, it's, it's a dance from the south of Mozambique, and um, it was actually one um, performed um, by, okay, in, in Mozambique, there are many, many migrant workers who go to South Africa to, to work in the mines in really terrible conditions. And um, at that time, they would be forced to live in conditions which were rather like camps. So they, they were separated from their families. And um, so you just have a, a lot of men in, in these very... Um, bad conditions, and so the Makwaela was was a, a song of resistance in those conditions that became, at the moment of independence, got reinvented as a sort of hymn to to um, revolution and and the international. Um, you might have noticed that that, that this line of people has um, is all men apart from one woman. Well, actually, the way that that dance would have would have um, been performed previously in South Africa, it wouldn't have been a woman, it would have been a man dressed up as a woman. And um, that man would have been the sort of sexual servant to the other men. So it's a very interesting history of the management of desire in these, these really horrendous conditions. Um, but also I think one of the, thing, the things that's interesting about the dance is, you know, these, this chant of forward, forward, and yet they're staying in the same place. And there's something very interesting about the way in which the idea of revolutionary nationalism, the, the way that Cabral um, uh, analysed it, was, was of, of um, a sort of meeting of different cultures and of different um, dialogues between the local and the, the transnational um, in the con kind of consolidation of Frelimo's power that idea of revolutionary nation, um, nationalism and the identity that it produced becomes ossified. So in going forward, they're actually staying in the same place somehow. Um, so through the 1980s, Frelimo, the Frelimo government became increasingly compromised by um, attacks by a force called Renamo um, that were sp sponsored first by um, Rhodesia and then by South Africa in retaliation for Frelimo's support of the ANC. Um, and the objective of displacing foreign distribution monopolies by regional intra-African circuits of in distribution was never realized. Yet some international cooperation was achieved, and where this was successful, it reflected solidarities forged during the struggle for independence and in the support that Mozambique gave to other liberation struggles. So one of the uh, important films was a film called um, Five Shots of the, from the Mauser, which was a film that was made um, when a number of Mozambican filmmakers, including Camilo de Souza, Joan Costa, and Licino Azevedo, went to Angola during the South African invasion um, in 1981. 
And then um, Juan Costa, or Fincho as he's known, um, worked with Angolan filmmaker Carlos Enriquez to make Pambere in Zimbabwe, um, a film which was about the first elections um, in Zimbabwe. Um, and this was a collaboration between the um, Instituto Angolano de Cinema and the INC that was the first um, Southern African co-production made entirely without external support. Um, some more ambitious projects um, were made as, as co-productions. Um, one co-production with, with Yugoslavia was the first um, feature-length fiction film that was made, a film called Os Tempos dos Leopardos in 1987. Um, though the experience of individual um, Mozambicans who worked on this film makes it clear that this power relation between um, Mozambique and uh, uh, Yugoslavia, they had a treaty of socialist friendship, was far from equal. Um, so um, one of the last films that the INC made um, was an, its next fiction feature, um, Jose Cardoso's um, The Wind Blows from the North, which was actually made in black and white so that the film could be developed independently by the INC laboratory. In 1986, Samora Michel was killed when his plane was mysteriously diverted and crashed on South African territory. Um, and... This eventually led to, um, in 1989, Frelimo renounced Marxist-Leninism, and this paved the way for negotiations that uh, led the country to having multi-party elections and embracing the free market. So Renamo became the opposition party. The economic crisis caused by the war, compounded by the withdrawal of support from Soviet bloc countries, meant that during the 80, 1980s, the INC's profits were increasingly appropriated for other, other uses by the state. Productions were cancelled. Cinemas across the country fell into an abject state. Um, and um, following this, this um, shift in, complete shift in, in political direction of the country, a new management structure was implemented um, in line with what, what was happening across um, many sectors on the insistence of international monetary bodies who threatened to withdraw much-needed loans. So what happened was those with higher education were promoted to management, and um, that had the effect of um, reconstructing, to an extent, the racial divisions produced by colonialism, um, which was what Frilimo's early training projects had sought to reverse. Um, the role of the INC was changed to that of a state regulator of private production companies who got no further financial support. And on the night of 12th February 1991, so between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union, seemingly as a, seemingly as a result of an electrical fault, but probably an insurance scam, um, the INC was um, almost completely destroyed by fire. So what remains is, is an archive that's partial and in ruins. The collection of international films was destroyed but in the fire, but most of the INC's productions survived. However, they're largely inaccessible. The paradox is that this archive embodies a set of aspirations that at the time of their emergence seemed like the beginning of something new and unstoppable. In fact, it marks the end of an era, both in terms of a technological shift to television and video and digital forms, and in terms of the failure of socialist African nation states to create a network of cinema distribution and production, independent from, from capitalist networks of distribution. The African revolutions of the 1970s are usually characterized today by, disappointment, by the disappointment and catas catastrophe that followed in their wake, and the very films that might produce a counter view or might a, a more complex view, the films of the armed struggle and those made by the ANC are rarely seen. Um, so I want to make a connection with, with con contemporary um, Mozambique just to, to finish off. Um, it, and Mozambique's transition to capitalism um, at the end of the Civil War is usually presented as, as, as the success story of a country that's moved on from an increasingly authoritarian Marxist-Leninism. But from another perspective, Mozambique is, is more deeply divided than ever between a tiny privileged political elite and a massive underclass. And in September 2010, that underclass suddenly became visible to the world when riots broke, broke out in Maputo, cutting off the city centre from the rest of the country for several days. 
These were protests against massive rises in food prices precipitated by a fall in wheat production in Russia. So Mozambique being at the, the hard end of, of, of um, globalization. The protests were organized at, at grassroots level by text messages that on phones that circumvented the state's organized organs of communication, namely radio and television. And even though smoke and gunfire were audible and visual, visible in such form of Puto, Mozambique and television didn't report the events at the time. If the role of the INC was to deliver an image of the people to the people, these were a people without an image, though they were spectacularly visible on the news in Europe, where no doubt their image served other kinds of neo-colonial narratives. So what emerged and circulated on the screen in Mozambique were images of a new, during the revolution, were images of a new political constituency, empowered African pe peoples in the process of revolution. The evocation of Griffith's birth of a nation, appropriated by Godard and evoked by the very name Kusha Kanema, indicates the precariousness and ambiguity of the image in relation to power, a danger that rises up in the gap between the image of the people and the people themselves but also a space of possibility. The theory of liberation as an act of culture developed during the armed struggle as a concept of the human capacity for cooperation and change is a response to the cultural imperialism symbolized by birth of a nation, but it responds to its claims of universality with a completely different dynamic in which specific cultures in dialogue transnationally produce forms of modernity that are local, but make a contribution to the culture and future of the world. What remains of the archive gives evidence of a different kind of globalization, a transnational public sphere in which Mozambique was briefly, in terms of cinema, the vanguard of the world. Okay. So, questions or comments? Hi, thanks very much for that great talk. I, I just was wondering if you could comment a bit on the first clip that you showed, and it seemed to me like it was a uh, of a different, um, I don't know, nature than the rest of your talk, and so I'm sort of wondering what you see as the relation of it. Okay, well, I suppose with that, with the scenes from the class struggle in Portugal, I mean, I, I was using that clip to really introduce the idea of, of cinegeography, of, a, of a kind of forms of relationality produced by cinema that connect um, different places and people and institutions. And I mean, I think what um, becomes apparent in that moment and which connects it to um, the example of Mozambique is um, at the moment of the Carnation Revolution, Portugal becomes part of a, a route um, so uh, Robert Kramer um, and Philip Spinelli were there for a while and then moved on to other projects. Uh, Celso and Lucas moved through there. They're the, the Brazilian filmmakers who, um, who uh, then went on to make, made a film in Portugal during the Carnation Revolution, a film called O Pato, and then went on to Mozambique. And there are countless others. So the idea of, of um, Portugal as the metropole that has um, a, a certain kind of relation of power to, to um, Mozambique and Angola and Guinea-Bissau is completely disruptive in the moment. It becomes part of a, 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 a point on a, 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 a sort of a radical trajectory, a, a different sort of mapping. Um, and so I think there, there is a connection, though it's not it's not a direct one, but I think one of the interesting things, there's a very interesting work by an artist called Anna Hathaly that was made at the time of the, the Carnation Revolution. It's called Revolution, and it's a short um, piece of film that's, that's, I think, usually shown on a loop, and it, it's, it's of, a, of walls in Lisbon, um, which have a mixture of graffiti and circus posters and political posters and so on, and you know, there you see kind of glimpses of graffiti that um, is sort of so solidarity with MPLA and so on. So what you have at this moment is the sense that there was part of, they were part of the same struggle, actually. 
I don't know if that starts to yeah, answer your question. I think I was thinking also that there was the, like, the trial of, the first, of that first clip. I can yell. <laughs> uh, feels like, I don't know how, how to quite say this, like feels a bit like the like American tradition of, I don't know, the tradition of documentary cinema making that, that actually came out of MIT. And so I don't know, I was sort of wondering if you were using it as a, as a contrast or it just seems sort of very much about those filmmakers and their journey and not so much like experimenting with form or with ideas. That was really, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with, with the idea of the militant image, we were trying to produce a sort of broad category that, that would take in both um, films that were um, very much in the service of particular political organizations, um, as well as um, films that were more in the mode of perhaps engaged cinema, where there's, there's a, a sort of um, an affiliation, but um, perhaps a sort of um, a, 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 um, a more of a commitment to uh, formal experimentation and to perhaps resisting um, uh, a complete um, uh, identification with a political organisation. So we, we include both because often they, so often they were alongside each other and saw themselves as part of the same um, project. I can't see you, so it's a little disconcerting. <laughs> Thank you for this um, material that I feel very um, compelled by. You know, just short clips definitely move me thinking. They take me to a different time period, literally, because we don't, we don't see this kind of material in you know, in our, <laughs> we see it in a different form. Mm -hmm. So for me, my first impulse is to ask you what is, um, what should be our relationship when we see this material today? Mm -hmm. Because we know this is archival material tied to its history, to its time. And of course there are relationships by the, of the people who made it to the work and where it was shown. So now we are decontextualizing it and using it for broadening the idea of militant cinema today, or what is militant cinema, right? So that, for me, is a double-edged sword, almost, because it's decontextualizing it, and then recontextualizing it towards what end. Mm -hmm. So one thought would be, what should be my relationship when I see this image? Should I feel uh, something for a time period that clearly was very violent, of the process of decolonization itself? Or should I think that, um, I mean, I'm just now making connections now as I'm, I'm thinking aloud because it's historical material that I feel that needs its context much more than broadening it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see my work as, as doing, trying to do both in a way. So the Millicent image that was the project that I've been working on with, with Kojo Russian, but my own, much of my own writing is um, uh, much more focused on, on Mozamb what happened in, with cinema in Mozambique. So I think you're absolutely right. There is this sort of moment of danger, I think, that we're in. Um, and particularly, I mean, I think often these, these images, people sort of delight in them. And there's this way in which they make us think of Sado Kita's photographs in Mali, for instance, which are very much commodified images as well. And I mean, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why we, we very much wanted to do a sort of program of events was so as to show these films. Um, and we're very much thinking of the idea of, of screening as in third cinema, where you, the, the screening precipitates a discussion. Um, so the screenings that we've had, we invite either the film director or someone who's really worked in a lot of detail on the film to provide a context, because I think without that historical context, there is a real danger that, that um, they become very seductive, Images that 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 um, 
uh, it's hard to make a connection with the present. I think one of the potentialities almost is their awkwardness, particularly in Mozambique. So, for instance, um, when, a few, when in 2010, shortly after the riots, I was, I was in Mozambique, we had a screening of, of Margaret Dickinson's film Behind the Lines, which has a very beautiful scene where uh, um, uh, different people involved in the struggle are teaching each other um, songs and dance, dance moves from their different regions. And um, one of the questions was, well, you know, what happened to that idea of, of Mozambican identity? And that's a really very real question. So, um, I mean, also, I've, one of my strong uh, beliefs is that, that this is part of the history of, of world cinema as well. And, you know, um, that's a very important part, I think, of what doing it, giving it a new context uh, and providing a historical, con historical context for these images starts to assert. Yeah, thank you. That was helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I don't really know how to phrase it. Uh, I, I had the impression, for example, you, you mentioned the, the, the um, uh, participation of big figures in the, in the, in the world of uh, sort of uh, revolutionary cinema as Jean Rouge and Jean-Luc Godard. Uh, with a little bit, I don't want to put my, uh, words in your mouth, but it, was, it seemed a little bit dismissive of their participation, whereas you uh, very much underlined the the, the inclusion of, uh, of filmmakers uh, from Brazil. Uh, and I, I, I wonder uh, two things. First, whether, uh, um, whether the reason for that uh, having been so is that uh, this emergence of an independent cinema did not have the momentum to capture the mainstream of revolutionary cinema at the time, or if you want to underline a uh, sort of... Um, post-colonial fraternity between, um, between well, post-colonies. And the other uh, part of, the, my, uh, of what I asked myself is, you, you are trying to explore the concept of uh, cinegeography, and there is obviously the non-coincidence that Brazil and Mozambique both speak Portuguese. So I wonder to what extent there is a, uh, how important is the concept of language to the cinegeography? Um. Okay, those are really interesting questions. I'm going to try and break it down. So with, with Jean Rouch and um, Jean-Luc Godard, I guess it's partly a sort of um, frustration with the way in which people's interest in Mozambique tends to be filtered through those figures. And, um, but nevertheless, they did do really interesting projects there, and there's a lot of work that's going on to um, assess them, particularly in, in Paris. But I sometimes feel like there's this sort of tendency that... If it exists in, in Calle du Cinema, it, it, it exists. You know? um, so maybe you were detecting something of, of that in the way I described those projects. I mean, it's also partly that you know, um, I couldn't talk about everything, so it's a, a choice about what to include and what not to, and, and I've written about those, those, those projects more, more extensively. I mean, with, with, um, with Rouge, he, um, he did a project in the university that was very much focused on Super 8, and um, you know, the recordings of everyday life, but also using those to make sort of micro-political in, um, interventions. So, for instance, there was a film in a hospital which actually produced some kind of concrete results because it it identified that they the, the patients who often travel from very very far to get treatment in in this hospital in Maputo needed a space to gather and socialize and 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 so on so that produced you know a change in in the org the spatial organization of, of the hospital um, I mean one of the things is that that um, I think Rouge had great hopes for what Super 8 might be able to do and he brought a, a very expensive film processor, Super 8 processor, with him. 
with the idea that they would have some autonomy from the INC. And also, the university was, was a more marginal site than the INC. So the INC was very much supervised by the Department of Ideological Work. Um, and so there were things that were possible at the university which wouldn't have been at the INC. And there was a later project where um, a group worked in Nyasa uh, province and they were using filmmaking. They weren't teaching people how to make films, but they were using filmmaking to, tr to transfer skills. And that really did um, sort of shift the power balances in the villages in which they worked to the extent that after two years the, the filmmakers involved got a phone call from the minister saying, well, you've done very good work, but it's time to stop. <laughs> because, in fact, the power relationships that Frelimo depended on in those areas was, was being disrupted. Um, so they are interesting projects. Um, but, I mean, people came from all over the world, really, to, 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 to do training and work there. So they had filmmakers from, from Britain. Margaret Dickinson went back and, and worked there for a year, training the, 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 the cohort of young people to become filmmakers. Um, but Canadians... Um, uh, so it was, I mean, I think that the, the, the system of the cooperance was quite kind of an individual one. It was about personal commitment. Um, and then there were also delegations that came. So, for instance, Santiago Alvarez came, I, th I believe, a number of times. Um, and there was also a delegation from North Korea. And funnily enough, they actually came at around the same time. And, of course, everybody wanted to work with the Cubans and not the North Koreans. And the films that got produced were very different in nature. So um, the North Korean team made a film that was called... Um, oh, something... I don't quite remember the title, but something like The People of Mozambique Marched Triumphantly Behind the Heroic Leader Samora Michel. And... Um, the Cuban team under Santiago Alvarez made a, f a, f a film called The New Symphony, which was uh, based, uh, the premise of it was, was um, Samora Michal's habit of, of singing at the beginning of meetings he had with his, his ministers. So very different kinds of films. And of course, a kayak symbolized a kind of, um, a kind of filmmaking that the filmmakers at the INC would have aspired to. Um, so, I'm um, just trying to think back to where I am with, with, with your question. So, yeah, I mean, a number of Brazilians did, did come as well. And, uh, of course, that historical linguistic connection is very strong and, and continues. And a number of them stayed in, in Mozambique or travel back frequently. Riquiera actually was born in Mozambique so, and left there when he was 17. So, and I think that he saw Mozambique as a place where he could operate on a wider scale, have an effect on a wider scale. So beyond just being an individual filmmaker, he could, he could affect national policy. Um, so he was kind of quite instrumental in some sort of key decisions about policy at the INC, although he never had a, um, an official position. So I'm not sure if that quite answered all of your questions, but... Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting to see um, some of those clips, even though we couldn't see the whole films. I mean, I was actually... That's what I wanted to do. Um, I felt like I'd like to see uh, the entire films. Mm -hmm. wanted to get a sense of uh, the context differently. And, and so it's interesting to hear about um, the cine geography um, gatherings. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the project overall. Um, that's one thing. Uh, also, I have three. <laughs> the other had to do with um, the Robert Kramer and um, how do you... Um, what, did he do other works that would uh, relate to the scene of geography's work that you've been involved with? Uh, and then the third, 
<laughs> is how do you, how would you situate someone like Chris Marker? Um, because it definitely comes to mind in terms of Sans Soleil and thinking about getting this out. So yeah. I'm going to start with, with the last question. Um, you know, it's really interesting because take the film Vintisinko, for instance, um, 25, um, the film made by Salso and Lucas. I saw that, the first time I saw that film was at a screening in Paris of a copy that had been found in Chris Marker's archive. So, I mean, he's key. Um, and particularly in relation to um, Guinea-Bissau, and uh, I think that there's actually quite a lot of research that needs to be done about, um, and sadly he's no longer with us for us to be able to ask him directly about, about those relationships, but um, Flora Gomes has talked about um, the importance of Chris Marker to him, and um, so his, um, and also Luanda Vietnam is, is another example of a film that, that I think produces a cinegeography, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's the, the project as we see it is, is not only about sort of tracing out, mapping these relationships between different people and different places and locations and institutions and so on, but also thinking about how films like Scenes from the Class Struggle in Portugal or scene, films like Luanda of Vietnam or, and, or Vinticinco produce, their, the, produce a geography aesthetically in terms of the translation of, of, of um, for, you know, formal translation and so on. Um, I mean, I'm particularly obsessed by scenes from the class struggle in Portugal, um, partly because of, of the, the history it relates to, um, but um, absolutely, I would have thought his work on Vietnam and, and um, indeed ICE, um, they're just not films that I've worked on particularly myself, but I think he's a really key figure. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, he and Marco are both very, very important. Um, so the militant image um, events that we've been doing, um, they're, they're partly an opportunity to explore films that we weren't able to gather research on for the special issue and um, to kind of, we see it as an ongoing project. Um, but it's also about trying to make uh, available to screen films that are not often seen. Um, sometimes the, the one that we did most recently, just a few days ago, involved producing English subtitles and uh, producing a new kind of context. So we had this screening um, of two films by Manuel Faria de Almeida, who was a Portuguese filmmaker who was born in Mozambique and studied at London's School of Film Technique in the 60s. And while he was there, he made um, a film called Streets of Early Sorrow, which references the Sharpeville Massacre. Um, so it's a film that was made in 1963. And it's, that, screening that film was a revelation because it's, it's a really, it's a great short film. And what was wonderful about screening it in London as well as there were people in the audience who could recognize the actor, who could, again, that thing of producing knowledge um, around, around the screening, um, the film screening. And the other film was um, the, his later film, which he made in 1965, was a film called Katembe, Seven Days in Lorenzo Marx. And that's a film that was, um, uh, when it was made, it was, uh, it's not really an anti-colonial film, but it is a film that um, is very concerned with questions of, of social justice and you know, it makes very apparent the stark um, contrast between the lives of Portuguese and the lives of Mo Mozambicans in, in, um, in, in what was then Lorenzo Marx. And it was censored many, many times. It was cut 103 times and then it was banned. So it, actually it's a film that's only just beginning to be um, seen in Portugal and it's forcing, because of its exper formal experimentation and this filmmaker was very much effect, um, influenced by the free cinema movement in Britain, um, 
it was, um, it's forced a sort of reassessment of, of the narrative of, of um, Cinema Nova in Portugal, which is um, described as sort of a Francophone-influenced film movement, um, very much centred on Lisbon. So the idea of, of Lisbon as the metropole, the centre of, of innovation that then gets belatedly exported to the periphery is, has to be rewritten in, in, that, in that context. So those are just some of the things that, 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 that we've been doing with, with these series of, of, of screening that's very much an ongoing project. Um, and yeah. What about in terms of production uh, in the present? Um, because I'm curious about through, those, through the um, way of producing knowledge uh, in these situations, uh, can you say anything about what kinds of things are being produced uh, in some of the different locations in the present? Is that a part of the project as well? Yeah, yeah very much so. I mean, one of the things that we were really pleased to include in the first um, Militant Image event was a screening of a film um, by Joseph Philippe Costa um, called The Red Line, which is about Thomas Harlan's film, um, Torabella, which is a film that was made during the Carnation Revolution about a land occupation. And it's a film um, which is very interesting. So m most of the films that were made during the Carnation Revolution were um, films that were made often for television. A film crew would go into a situation, make the film very quickly. It would involve often a, a, a voiceover um, that would exp explicate the images, explain the images. And Torabella, the film crew actually stayed in the car, in, on the, f it's a film about a land occupation. So the peasants working on the land seized the, the land and, and formed a cooperative. And the film crew, led by Thomas Harlan, spent many, many months just filming. And there are lots and lots of long takes um, of arguments, mainly, um, the sort of micropolitics of cooperation, if you like. And it's a film because it has this very um, intense sense of immediacy. And it's often uh, when in, in the sort of, it has a very particular relationship to, to kind of collective memory of, of the Carnation Revolution. So often if there's a sort of uh, an item on the, on the television about the Carnation Revolution, they will use clips from that film. And it often serves a narrative of this sort of crazy wild revolution that we had and isn't it a relief that we've turned to normal. Um, and it's um, so, the Joseph Philippe Costa's film was really a kind of very, very detailed uh, research into the kind of construction of that film um, and the way in which it has become a kind of screen memory for the event to the extent that even the participants in the cooperative remember their own lives, that moment in their lives through the film. So. Um, it's, it's, I think he set out to do it as a, a kind of ethnographic contrast between that moment and the present day. And it ended up being something, I think, a lot more complex about the cinematic construction of the event and way, the way in which, in that film, it produced the event. So Harlan had, um, he had gone to Portugal intending to make a film about... Um, the kind of class suicide of the Portuguese army, to use Cabral's um, concept. Um, and in fact, so he had very close connections to the MFA and at certain key moments, he brought them in to support the cooperative. So he was quite a galvanizing force in producing this, this occupation as well. So, um, and he, you know, Joseph Philippe, interviewed Harlan a number of times before he died. He died during the making of the film. And he talked quite unapologetically about the cinematic manipulation of the event, you know, manipulating people to produce um, uh, a happening that wouldn't, might not have, they might not have had the courage or the, the strength to, to do otherwise. So it's a very interesting film. And so we're, we're very keen to include um, films that, that are sort of reflecting on the place, I mean, going back to your question, the place of these kind of images in this archive in the present. Um, 
I, I, I think we could have so many conversations about the making, the recontextualizing. I mean, it's so rich of possibilities to tease out what we can make of this moment or this idea of social justice that is embedded in the history of these films. I'm just wondering, also embedded in these films is this idea of mar marginalizing women and their voices. Because at the same time, there were women's freedom struggles going on. And I'm curious if in these conversations, could we situate a different subject position, a different author and a different viewer in reading it in the present? And if there is a way to include a, a conversation about subjectivity, and I, I say women not just as a gendered, also as gendered, but as an open situation for any other. Because as we know, when we look at this historical material, we do know that um, the position of the other has constantly shifted over time, and it, it is always shifting. So who, who are these films made for then and now? Mm -hmm. It's just a... Yeah, I mean, I, I always feel like it's in the sort of um, the textures of experience around the films that, that these kind of questions can be, start to be prized, prized open. And um, I mean, I mentioned Margaret Dickinson's film, but, but there were, you know, a few key female figures involved in these struggles. Sarah Maldora is one, of course. Um, um, and in Mozambique, Mo Moira Fojas was, was um, a female um, filmmaker who, who made a beautiful film called A Day in a Collective Village. And I think it was very, very, very hard for her. <laughs> um, and she, she, was, um, uh, she was an interesting figure because Samora Michelle liked to have her alongside him. Samora Michelle was very conscious of, of the, the power of the image. And um, so he would be, particularly when he traveled abroad, he'd be very careful about you know, which photographers were in his sort of retinue, um, you know, so that the, to reflect this, the um, anti-essentialist politic of, of, of Frelimo, the official, the official line. So um, uh, Mozambican photographers of Chinese origin, for instance, you know, Mora Fojas was, I think she had a really tough time because she was one of the few women at the INC. Um, and she eventually left Mozambique. Um, um, but I think that there's, there's a sort of wider conceptual question to what, what you're pointing to. And I mean, I think that, that one of the, the places where, in relation to the Carnation Revolution, where that comes out in, is in the film that exists of the People's Assemblies. And there were really interesting discussions of the role of women in those. And, I mean, I think there's also this way in which the figure of the woman is really uh, kind of key. I mean, obviously in Sarah Maldora's film, um, um, but as a sort of um, figure of potentiality in a way. I mean, Usman Semben's films as well, um, La Noir de and others. Um, and I mean, I would... Although the, the films that I've shown and discussed, feminism doesn't get addressed directly in them. I mean... Um, it's hard to situ... I mean, it's, the idea is not to pack every <laughs> revolutionary possibility at the time into a conversation, but it, there's always this feeling, you know, that this moment... The, when, when we see such films in the present today, I always have this feeling that m my memory is is charged with, you know, the masculine cinematic image of violence and how, how do we shift our own imaginations of that time period by juxtaposing a different voice each time we rescreen. Mm. So I'm, I'm just saying that this is my own anxiety, yeah. <laughs> that when I watch this, I'm confronted by that history that I've been exposed to because I, I didn't live this time and I nev I've never been to these countries. So what do we do 
as an audience? How do we rearrange our imaginations of the past, of this moment, as we, as we are looking? I mean, the, the idea of militancy is a very, it, it's a very charged word, and mm. I don't know how long we have. I don't want to keep talking. Somebody else wants to. That's fine. You know, the idea, that we, what do we do with that word? It's, I, I think of it straight and you know, straight up Maoist militancy or the way it has been claimed by a certain kind of militancy today. Mm. And how do we liberate that from it and put it in the context of social justice as, as you put it earlier, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's so many, um, one of the things that we wanted to, I mean, you know, we, we chose the title The Militant Image as a provocation, you know, so that people would ask what that is. What is the militant image? And one of the things that we wanted very much to include was, was um, filmmaking projects where, um, that were unapologetic about being instrumentalized to a cause. And that was really, really important. Um, uh, because um, there's a sense in which um, the word propaganda is used to foreclose discussion of that. And I think that was one of the things we really wanted to to challenge and to an extent just sort of ignore that whole discussion so that we could get to talking about the films and looking at how they operated in particular circumstances. Um, but I think that your comment is actually really interesting and opens out to you know, a much broader set of questions as well. Yeah, I think one of the um the, one of my anxieties about this is, you know, you talk about a, uh, an unapologetic instrumentalization that these radical filmmakers had. Uh, what I would be a little bit wary of, uh, I think there's a fine line between, um, you know, sort of like historical contextualization of these things and then historical fetishization of them in that then it just ends up being re-instrumentalized. You know, you have this framework that you're looking at the history of Mozambique and this, and I think on that level, uh, the idea of a formal translation of these things is a bit of a mystification. You know, it's the, the tra transparency of using these things as forms of cultural capital is just as uh, easy uh, a path. So I think the emphasis on, you know, what is saying about uh, leads in this direction, you know, uh, and uh, the idea of contemporary forms of militancy is probably a lot more, you know, uh, I would say important than historic, you know, sort of presenting a historical framework that, that you would say is, you know, da, da 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 da. So it just, it feels to me sometimes, you know, especially with individual commitments t uh, such as myself or somebody else's towards uh, a projection environment as this kind of like the, the space of radical potential. You, you don't want it to be, uh, or at least I don't want to see it uh, s set within uh, a context that would sort of, you know, um, uh, what would the right word be like? Uh, denature it <laughs> a little bit, right? So yeah, I mean, I think that, I Nevertheless, I do think that there's a really important job to do in terms of there's there's so much work to be done on you know films that have been overlooked, films that are inaccessible. Well, a lot of so that is the screening. It seems like you know, and so when you have touches of this, the 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 films itself themselves, that's what's most compelling to me. I want to keep watching. I want to see more. You know, yeah. so it's like that's rather than. Uh, you know, some kind of discursive sort of um, maybe appropriation. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not. I mean, I think but, that you know. for me, it's always driven by a question of, okay, what what do we want to know, and what is the the history of of the moving image that we want to produce? And it always is a is a production. You know, it's always a construction and. The predominant one, the dominant one, is one that has marginalized these materials. Um, that's why they are not readily available. That's why they are decaying. That's why when we had the, the event in Paris, two or three people talked about Vintisinko, and they all showed clips which had the same scratch. 
because the same copies had gone round these researchers because that's the only one that was available, you know. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm actually very committed to, to this work of, of, of which is historical work, but I see it as something that has to take place alongside, obviously, and it's always a danger that something gets decontextualized. And particularly, I think, it's, 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 um, it's, it's also about the way in which um, these films that have been produced for a certain context get translated into an art context as well. Yeah, and that's, I think that's, that's a real a, danger. That's huge. Well, that's yeah. a huge danger, obviously. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the things that Jaisal said I thought was very interesting, which was the, decon the danger of the decontextualization seems to be that you're, it's almost like you're, you're uncoupling it from the conditions which produced it in the first place. And those conditions, which you refer to as neoliberalism now, as opposed to colonization then, are still very much present. So you know, like you have to, you have to make sure that that, or I would I would think that um, uh, one would have to be really sort of meticulous about not making making sure that you're not kind of like fetishizing these things, and you're actually thinking, if I'm going to put this energy into framing it. Well, you can extrapolate all these other ways that you could commit to that. You know. Hi, I'm sorry to sit in the dark. I can go. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, following up on those comments, um, I guess I have two questions. One of them is, so the first is I, I'm, I'm curious to the degree to which these screenings have opened up a conversation about not just the images as, not just the films kind of historically or the way that they are or their form, but also kind of into a question of uh, of the of the, like the politics of that time period or, or of ideology or of this question of what does it mean to be militant and this kind of masculine implication of of these particular visions of change that are represented I, I don't want to say represented in these films because that's not exactly what I mean but I'm not sure if you maybe you get where, where I'm going with this um, and or if you don't you can <laughs> ask me and so and my other question is uh, it seems in this talk anyhow, c conspicuously, or I've noticed the con sort of conspicuous absence of any discussion of Arab films and also in kind of a third cinema um, context in general. And I guess I know that maybe part of that was had to do with language because these gatherings didn't include non-romantic romance language speaking people or um, well, I mean, I mentioned the connection with Algeria, um, which was really, really important at that time. Um, and, I mean, as I said, I was focusing on a particular cine geography um, because that's my area of, of expertise. Um, but, I mean, there's uh, the... the uh, Cinemateca in, in Algeria has been very difficult to to access, and it still remains extremely difficult to access. And I do know um, a, a researcher who may be able to to do some really interesting work, but it's very very precarious um, and difficult to do. Um, so a lot of those, although we know about some of these these connections um, between, for instance, the INC and um, Algiers. Um, there's a lot of work still to do, I would say. Um, yeah, sorry, I should just clarify. I mean, I didn't mean that as a critique at all. I just meant it as like a, I'm so curious as to why in these anthologies, often apart from Algiers, you know, say the, the Palestinian cinema unit isn't represented in any of these discussions and it seems like, well, it just seems so curious to me. So I was wondering if you knew anything about that. Um, I don't know very much about Palestinian cinema. I've heard some really interesting talks about it, but um, uh, I mean, I think that there are these sort of categori categorizations which, which, 
we need to question. And I think that, that, that I mean, one of the interesting things that Okri Enrizos um, show the short century did was to include um, North African countries in a definition of, of, of African revolution. I think that was a really important um, gesture that, that that exhibition made. So, um, I mean, precisely the idea about, about cinegeography is about bringing things into relationship that, ship that might otherwise be kept apart. Um, and that is the kind of work that we would hope to reach out to. Was there another part to your question? Yeah, I guess I was hoping you could speak to like the first part of my question about whether this, these screenings, these film events that you're holding have generated any discussion about the ideologies or the kind of visions of transformation that these films are represent? Yeah, very much so. I mean, obviously it depends on, on, on the context. Um, um, but I mean, one of the reasons why we have always tried to, to include in the discussions participants of, in these events as well as kind of onlookers at the, of, of these events and people who are of a different generation who are, are researching or have an interest is, is to produce those kind of dialogues. And, and um, one of the very nice things that happened on Thursday when we screened Faria Dalmeida's film was we had Margaret Dickinson who participated in the filmmaking of The Armed Struggle who asked very pointed questions about why Faria Dalmeida didn't stay in Mozambique. Like she said, we would have needed him, you know. Um, he could have stayed. Um, we also had um, Jean Shiri, who, who was involved in Zanu, Zanu as a teenager and had gone to Lorenzo Marx and, and talked about that in relation to rock and roll. So, I mean, I think that these, these um, kind of dialogues are exactly the kind of thing we want to produce, but also to sort of, I think also to, to, to interrogate the politics of those times. And, and I mean, it's, I think it's kind of, I think it's very interesting that the nation state was, was, was understood to have this particular kind of potential as a sort of framework for, um, for, for decolonizing cinema internationally. And that's kind of hard for us to think about these days. So, yeah, absolutely. So, um, maybe this is a good point to stop. Um, I, I found it a very interesting discussion uh, in addition to the presentation. And we're going to continue tomorrow uh, in the seminar in any case. Uh, but I think it's just a kind of beginning uh, of opening up uh, different possibilities for further thinking. And so thank you thank very you. much, thank you. Ross. <laughs>